June 6, 1944. For many, the Normandy invasion is seen as the defining day of World War II. Yet even now, little is known about the role 850 transport planes played on D-Day. They were critical to the Allies' success. Now the DC-3 is a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde aircraft because it has this civilian life, but it also has this military life. During the Second World War, the DC-3 helped the Allied forces secure victory. In the Cold War, it saved West Berlin from a Soviet takeover. We were not afraid of these candy bombers. We all knew that they had come to help us. In Vietnam, however, the Savior plane became a vicious weapon sent in by night. Following her military career, this chameleon of the skies transforms herself once more. She becomes an airliner again and the grand lady of post-war aviation. The DC-3's many names reflect its long and storied history. Sky Sleeper, Dakota, Candy Bomber, and C-47. It has flown for decades. I mean, uh, what other aircraft can you say has flown for nearly a century and continues to fly? And no other plane in the world has been built in such numbers. The DC-3 was launched in California in 1936, and in just 10 years, more than 16,000 of them were produced. In the US, it revolutionized air travel, sidelining the railroad for long-distance transport. The DC-3's main competitor was a German plane. The U-52 had an aluminium alloy structure, it was also popular and reliable, but could only carry 15 passengers. The DC-3 was superior to the U-52 in every respect. More seats, better flight performance, a modern design. It became a role model for several generations of passenger aircraft. But soon, the Second World War would dramatically change its daily life. In Switzerland, the American plane became part of history. This one nearly ended up on a highway intersection in Dubai. Now restored to her former glory, She's enough of an eye-catcher to rival the Alps. She was rescued by Hugo Matas, a local businessman. The DC-3 has become his hobby and now plays an important role in his life. Each year, he spends about 70 hours in the cockpit. You can feel the plane when you fly it. You have to take it in your hands and experience it. As a pilot, I'm important, so I have to do it myself. It's something quite special. In 1936, Swiss Air decided against the German U-52, choosing the DC-3 instead, with Paris, London and Berlin among the airline's prime destinations.
Switzerland became Douglas's first customer in Europe. During World War II, the Swiss DC-3 wore neutral paint to avoid being shot down by the Germans as enemy aircraft. Not all DC-3s are enjoying as pleasant a retirement as the vintage plane in Switzerland. Of the 16,000 planes built, most are now grounded. But even in the aircraft boneyards, a DC-3 retains a good value, unlike most other aircraft. In Wisconsin, retired hulls are waiting to take to the skies once again. They are worth a few thousand dollars each. The airframe is fantastic. It is, after all, a DC-3. You modernize the electronics, you put the new engines in it, and you have almost a new airplane. At Basler Turbo Conversions in Oshkosh, these veterans of World War II are given a new lease on life. The Swiss vintage plane also started her second career here as a retired C-47, the military version of the DC-3. In these hangars, Basler employs 100 men and Ashley Hazy. I've only been an aircraft mechanic for a year now, over a year. So, honestly, I was extremely intimidated walking in, knowing I was going to be the only girl. Ashley has been interested in planes since she was a child. She began her career helping out at airfares, which is what brought her to Oshkosh, home to the world's largest aviation show. I just knew right away I wanted to be an aircraft mechanic <laughs> and I love it very much. Ashley and her colleagues are working exclusively on DC-3s. This is what Basler specializes in. For Ashley, every wreck has its own personality. They're history. I love history so much. And each aircraft tells a different story. And I mean, even Judy over there, obviously that one has quite a history as well. And um, it's just, it's amazing what aircraft stories can tell. <laughs> Judy, for example, could tell how she was shot at in the war and how she performed several emergency landings. When Judy was built in California, the world looked quite different. The original idea of Douglas was to construct an airplane that offered seats during the day and beds at night. The first customer, American Airlines, placed the order with a mere handshake instead of a formal contract. The service was limited, was also very expensive. You had to be fairly wealthy to fly. It was not for everyone. People dressed in their Sunday best to go flying because it was an occasion. Being an air hostess suddenly became a highly sought after career. The sleeper provided great comfort. Huge seats like living room chairs, modern ladies and gentlemen's toilets. And at night, the seats became beds. Hollywood loved the sleeper. For the first time, actors could fly in from New York without any annoying hotel accommodation or train transfers. 
Travel time between east and west coasts was cut by more than half to only 15 hours. including three stopovers for refueling. So the DC-3 kind of changed things by making the journey the destination, uh, as opposed to sort of slogging it out and, and just getting where you need to go. The planes landed in Glendale, near Beverly Hills. The DC-3 was fast, robust, and extremely economical. Other airlines also placed their orders with Douglas for regular service without any beds. This was a masterstroke of design and made the plane highly profitable. The Hollywood sleeper has almost been forgotten today, but not in Florida. Palm trees line the road to the Moss family airfield. When the last sleeper was sold a few years ago, the family acted fast. The original aircraft registration number is still visible. The family wants to restore the DC-3, but they lack the money to do so. This is what flagship Tennessee looked like in her prime, back when she flew the rich and the beautiful across the United States. We're going to bring it back to what it was in, uh, in 1936, as the, the oldest DC-3 in the world today. And it, you know, it's, it was the sixth one ever built. So of all the DC-3s, this one uh, really, really deserves to to live again and to, to show the world what airline travel was in the mid-30s. On board, the food was freshly prepared. There were no classes like today. Every ticket was equally expensive. A flight across the United States cost the equivalent of two months' salary, and you were even allowed to smoke. I started um, when I was about 15 years old flying DC-3s with my dad from, from Miami to the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, and, and uh, you know, in 2007 we bought our first one as a family. In the 1990s, the Moss family was living and flying in Alaska. At the age of seven, Glenn was allowed to take control of the plane, under his father's supervision, of course. It was really something to go to Alaska with my parents, to be able to fly with my dad from Fairbanks to the different Indian villages, gold mines, places that um, really uh, no one gets to go to. They'd put the boys in the front seat. Charlie was 11, 10 turned 11, and Glenn was seven. And they'd put the boys in the front seat, and they'd go in the back. And the boys had that control of the airplane. And it's me, and that's Glenn. Uh, these were good days. You remember you were saying to all kids have to do this, and I said, be quiet and keep flying. And Glenn had to stand up. He had to stand on the paddles and pull it back, but they, they made it go. You know, they got the feeling of it from the time they were really little. The Swiss entrepreneur Ugo Matus is also following his dreams. However, there is a difference of a few million dollars between his ambitions and those of the Moss family. In Oshkosh, the Swiss hobby pilot has bought another DC-3 from the meadow, Judy. Let's talk about my aeroplane. Same configuration. Together, Hugo Matus and the workshop manager discuss the rebuilding of the aircraft. During World War II, Judy carried paratroopers in just two years from now, she will be able to do so again. And what is your impression now with this airplane? It's not bad. 
actually. The fuselage is not very bad from, from just the initial look at it. I don't think that it's, I really don't think that it's very bad. There are some spots, obviously, but um, you know, there's not as many holes in these frames. You know, they look pretty good. There is still a lot to be done. I knew it when I bought her. Buying the plane costs around one twentieth of what I'll spend in total. And by the time I'm finished, I'll have invested the same thing 19 times until it's what I want it to be. The cutting of sheet metal requires strength and an eye for detail. This aluminium sheet will replace a piece of Judy's outer skin. Well, right now what I'm doing is uh, I am going through and basically overhauling this rudder for our next aircraft that's going to look similar to that one. Um, I've done fabric covering, lots of riveting, structural work, all kinds of stuff. So you need to have good muscles too? Or? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I, I've definitely gotten stronger. <laughs> so I'd say yes. Okay. But you don't have to be as strong as the guys to do it. So. <laughs> Three thirty in the afternoon is clocking out time at Basler. At Douglas in Santa Monica, a new era is looming. The factory is working around the clock. A few hundred DC-3s leave the production halls every month. Nearly all of them are delivered to the military as C-47s. In December 1941, the United States entered World War II. Many civilian DC-3s, including all sleepers, were requisitioned and converted into C-47 military transporters. In addition, the United States built up its own stock. It also supplied hundreds of C-47s to its allies, especially to Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Obviously, it's military story. It was quite a bit different. You're not getting plush seats. There were metal benches for the, the troopers to, to sit on, or they could take two light trucks. I mean, this is, this is a remarkable airplane and basically had a, a reputation to carry whatever you could put in it, whatever you could throw at it. In England, the 101st US Airborne Division was rehearsing for D-Day for the liberation of Western Europe. Thousands of paratroopers supported a landing operation in Normandy. One of the units later became known as the Band of Brothers. Their most important vehicle for transport and supplies was the C-47, a true workhorse. We had number of C-47 practice jumps in the States. And of course, after we got over to Europe, to England, we perhaps had 15 or 20 practice jumps from the C-47. The Americans brought as much as they could to the table. They only had one chance with the invasion, so it had to be successful. Their surprise attack from behind German lines helped establish the beachheads. For the first time in a war, cargo gliders supplied the paratroopers. The C-47s towed them towards the target zone. The gliders carried everything that they could. And we needed the supplies, we needed the ammunition, and we needed the equipment. So the gliders provided that for us. We couldn't carry a Jeep with us on the C-47. It had to be on the gliders. 
uh, I'm sure that if it weren't for the gliders or if it weren't for the C-47s pulling them, <laughs> the mission would never have been accomplished. The gliders were made of wood. They did not have to return and were therefore designed to be disposable. They had a high failure rate. They all cracked up. The minute they hit the ground, they cracked up. They were no more good. And uh, sometime when they cracked up, they cracked up a lot of people with them. The paratroopers called them flying coffins because we would have nothing to do with them. They were dangerous. As the invasion approached, the Americans had cause to be concerned. To motivate his troops, General Eisenhower, the commander in chief, addressed them in rousing terms. in the United States arrived 48 hours after the amphibious assault began. I recall very well that everyone was nervous. Very quiet, but very nervous. You could see it. You could feel it. General Brereton, on the line for the takeoff, passes on the traditional good luck charm, a rabbit's foot. In a first wave, around 850 military transporters released 17,000 paratroopers, coming back in further waves to provide them with supplies. The invasion has started. On their flight to France, Ed Shames and his comrades watched the deployments of hundreds of warships making their way towards the beaches of Normandy. The invasion began with shelling from the naval artillery. But even this opening failed to pave the way for the ground troops. They encountered strong German defense fire. As long as the enemy could supply enough ammunition to its beach fortifications, the Allied invasion would not be able to succeed. It was the task of the paratroopers to cut off the German supply routes by taking control of all bridges near the beaches, so that the Allied ground forces could land safely. Stand up! Hook up! This mission was extremely dangerous. The generals expected a casualty rate of 50%. Ed Shames and his comrades realized what they were up against. I was afraid, scared, shaking like anyone else at that time because we knew that was a real thing. I was scared to death at that moment. It took him about 15 minutes to land. Floating in the air, the men were exposed to German defensive fire. I jumped into a bunch of flak, tracer bullets, artillery shells, flak, and so forth. How I wasn't hit, I'll never know, because the plane you could hear the flak bounce off the plane. We were getting ready to jump. Not only that, our parachute was coming down and you could hear something going through the parachutes, cutting through the silk. And that sound has never left me to this day. Few units jumped off at the right point because the pilots had lost their orientation. A new radar system intended to mark the landing zones did not work. Some units ended up five miles from their drop zone, others as far as 50 miles away. The 
we were there in no man's land, enemy territory. We had to make contact with the beach forces, which we did after three days. Once they had landed, the paratroopers were supplied exclusively from the air. The C-47s came back again and again, pulling the gliders behind them. But that is what the German Wehrmacht were expecting. They had flooded the fields and meadows to prevent the gliders from landing safely. The Germans also put up glider barriers, like poles, like trees, in the fields where gliders would land. Uh, they did that quite a few places in Normandy, but we overcame them somehow. Overcoming the barriers came at a high price to the glider crews. One in four soldiers was killed in the operation. But those who survived helped turn the tide in favor of the Allies. The German troops ran out of ammunition, allowing Allied forces to conquer the beaches and advance inland. The Wehrmacht had to withdraw or surrender after only three days, the Allied forces moved eastward to recapture France. Given the high risks faced by the paratroopers and glider crews, General Eisenhower honored the courage of his men, but also praised the DC-3 as a key factor in winning the Second World War. The first newsreel footage of the invasion to appear in American theaters featured a plane called That's All, Brother. This DC-3 became a legend of the war. When the crew baptized the plane with this name, the paratroopers intended to send a message to Adolf Hitler. That's all, brother. After the war, the famous aircraft disappeared without a trace until it was miraculously rediscovered at Basler in Oshkosh 70 years later. We actually didn't even know we had it. It was sold to us by, by a gentleman who was down on his luck and had pretty much run his operation out of money and he wanted to sell the airplane to us. And we put it back with the other airplanes in our boneyard, we call it back in the grass. And it sat there for several years, I think seven maybe. And we, we just didn't even know what we had. By sheer chance, a historian recognized That's All, Brother, by her serial number. Basila suddenly had a superstar on their hands, but also a problem. Many wanted to buy the famous warhorse including Swiss enthusiast Hugo Matas. But in the end, he had to make do with Judy. It was annoying. They had promised I could buy it, but I understand the historical reasons. This plane belongs to America. In Oklahoma City, the fate of many vintage planes rests in the hands of Roy Owens. Roy is giving the radial engines a thumbs up or down. No pilot would ever dare to disagree with Roy's assessment. A well-maintained engine is the best life insurance a pilot can have. Just behind us is the teardown area. The air, air, uh, engines have come in, they're disassembled. From there, they go to cleaning. From there, uh, polishing and inspection before they're built. Everything was handmade. 
and everything is so precise. They're just amazing engines. Today, Judy's radial engine is under inspection. It's dismantled to see if its cylinders still work safely enough or whether they've been pushed a little too hard. The DC-3 has two engines with 14 cylinders each. Each cylinder must reliably deliver 86 horsepower generating a total of 2,400 horsepower. Okay, here's the filter. The roll of the cylinder is very important. It takes all the heat, the thermal shocks. It is replaced more than any other part on the engine when it, and during its lifetime. Roy is in no doubt. Judy's cylinders are only good for the scrap heap and must be replaced. For the next step, Roy needs good friends. What do we gather up here to send Roy Owen? I, I think for two engines, so. Right. I've got a new master rod here. Brand new master rod here. A main bearing. One, one main front, bearing. And uh, that should be the rear. The rear, okay, two. And what about piston, piston ring? I think we got them right here. Okay. And a bearing shell. So 25 to a box. It's uh, World War II vintage, but as you can see, it's perfectly preserved inside. They, uh, they're packaged with Cosmoline and um, I don't know, it's okay. really packaged to stand the test of time. It was all military surplus um, post-World War II, and, and then the government would sell it off in lots, and, and the, the big engine shops would buy the lots, and uh, they were able to continue building engines for decades off of military surplus, and, and still today. With a little help from the Moss family, his friends in Florida, Roy can build brand new engines from 80-year-old spare parts that were never used and therefore not exposed to any stress. After all, what we're looking at is an airplane that flew more than 80 years ago. It flew barely a few years after the first transatlantic flight solo of Lindbergh and something like less than 30 years after the first flight of the Wright brothers. So you're looking at very significant aircraft with a fascinating history, a fantastic history in every corner of the globe. Rods, bearings, master rod bearings. Nice. For Hugo Matters, Roy has yeah, only bad cylinders. news today. There is total wear in almost all of Judy's cylinders. Yeah, cylinders. Um, they're, oh, they're heavily used. Huh? Very used. You like newer, better quality stuff, and these uh, would not fit your needs, I don't feel. Mm -hmm. So there are new cylinders available. I and agree. All 14 here. 14. Nice. Seven front, seven rears. So das ist gebraucht ist, das wussten wir, aber das we knew that it was used, but I did not expect it to be so extreme. The engines are completely exhausted. Ist jetzt richtig ausgeleiert. For the Swiss pilot, it's a bitter pill to swallow. 14 new cylinders for a whopping $50,000. But as an engineer, he knows that parts of this quality come at a price. It was built to last for decades. You can see, logically, how it was put together. Each mechanical part has its own function, and so it makes sense when you look at it. It's just phenomenal. A week later, the brand new old engine will be on its way to Oshkosh to become a part of Judy.
when a hobby becomes serious, passion may be what is most required. But knowledge is equally crucial. Mobility has become more important to us than ever before, but so too has reliability. Such strengths determine success or defeat. And not only in wartime, and not only on the DC-3. Not even the engineers at Douglas could have guessed that, some 80 years later, their design would be considered the most successful plane in aviation history. In 1948, this DC-3 helped to save West Berlin from a Soviet takeover. Instead of being shut away in a museum for the rest of her days, this candy bomber is intended to fly passengers over Berlin. The pilot Frank Helberg, the owner of a small airline, is aiming to get his dream off the ground. But to get started, he requires a license he doesn't have yet. You can clearly recognize how this design became the mother of modern airliners. In Berlin, she had a huge political impact too. She turned former enemies into friends. This is the heritage of this plane, and that's what we want to tell. Berlin, after the Second World War, was a city in ruins. The German capital had paid heavily for its role at the heart of the conflict. Its people lived in holes and cellars. They were starving. So-called rubble women cleared the sites of the bombed-out houses. But then the victors began to argue. In June 1948, the Soviet Union blocked all land routes into Berlin so that the Western Allies could no longer get supplies to their sectors of the city. The Americans and the British decided to supply two million people from the air. It would become the most ambitious airlift ever attempted. DC-3s were brought in again, including 300 British Dakotas. Berliners called them candy bombers. One of the pilots was Gail Halverson. He is filming with his camera. Many pilots still knew Berlin from the war. We had got used to aircraft noise as children from the Allied air raids in the war. But after the war, there wasn't much air traffic over Berlin. Now it started again in 1948 with the airlift. We were not afraid of these candy bombers. We all knew that they had come to help us. In June 1948, Germany was divided into four occupied sectors. The candy bombers reached West Berlin using two corridors from Hamburg and Frankfurt. They were the first air corridors in the world. As soon as the planes were unloaded, they returned to West Germany using a third return corridor towards Hanover. Berlin was probably the busiest airport on the planet for a brief period of time. Anything from food to coal to milk, everything that the Berlin population needed was flown in. It was amazing. Every pilot had to make a successful first landing in Berlin or fly back immediately without landing at all. Their schedule was excruciatingly tight. Food and coal were the primary supplies flown in on the DC-3s. German workers had 30 minutes to unload each aircraft. That was break time for the pilots. Gail is filming the snack bar where the pilots got their sandwiches. They flew to Berlin up to seven times each day. Affected by the abject poverty he saw among the children of Berlin, Gail saved some candy from his own rations and dropped it out of his plane, attached to little parachutes. Soon the other pilots began to do the same. The German children loved it. With this gesture, the Americans won the hearts and minds of the West Germans.
If there was a parachute coming down, then hundreds of children would run through the streets and chase it. It was an adventure for us. As though you had found some golden treasure. Yes, a bar of chocolate. I didn't know a single child back then who had a whole chocolate bar for themselves. Today, thousands of people barbecue here every summer. When Boris Franska looks out over the abandoned Tempelhof airfield, the old Berlin airport, he wonders how many of them know about the role it played some 70 years ago. At the new Berlin airport, the DC-3 crew cannot take off, as their old candy bomber is no longer airworthy, and their new one lacks the proper license. Putting in the seats from the old plane should help the new aircraft to get the license needed. We measure the old candy bomber which flew in Berlin and make a comparison between the two aircraft, so we are allowed to transfer the passenger cabin from the old to the new aircraft. Let's take the cockpit as a reference point. European aviation law is complex. In order to transfer the license, engineers have to confirm, using a cross laser, that both aircraft are identical down to the last millimeter. If this is confirmed, getting the passenger license for this old lady should be a pure formality. Berlin has an incredible history, from the wars to the wall, and this plane will help us to tell this story to the world. After the airlift, the DC-3 served as a passenger plane for a few more years. But the emergence of faster and more comfortable jets soon put it out of business. The Boeing began to take control of the skies. First the 707 on long-haul flights, then the 727 for middle-distance routes, and in the mid-1960s, the Boeing 737 for short hauls. But even in the jet age, the veteran roared back to life. In Vietnam, the DC-3 earned her final nickname, Puff the Magic Dragon, after a well-known hippie anthem. In Vietnam, the armed cargo version AC-47 did not rain chocolate, but rather fire and death. First, tracer ammunition was shot to detect and illuminate the targets at night. Then came a hail of machine gun bullets, firing up to 6,000 rounds per minute. The magic dragon became the messenger of death. There were three large guns uh, set up in the rear port side of the aircraft. And because of its, its turning capability and because it was a slower aircraft, it could actually swing around in a, in a pylon formation and hit extremely tight targets just continuously. So they could basically hold down the enemy in a, in a, in a basically a firing pattern, just circle around them and keep them pinned into this, this one area. The crew flew until they ran out of either fuel or ammunition. Thanks to the gunships, the US Air Force managed to stop several enemy offensives. But this time, not even the DC-3 could turn around their military fortunes.
After the US withdrawal from Vietnam, the DC-3 finally seemed to be consigned to history in most parts of the world. But as it turns out, its story was far from over. There are still new and exciting chapters to be written. In the 1990s, the DC-3's old virtues are being enhanced with new technology, such as turbo engines and a modern cockpit. Vintage aircraft are being reborn as Basler turbos. The paint is done, all of the systems have been checked. The airplane is ready to be delivered to the customer. In fact, the customer will be showing up today to sign the contract, hopefully. Good morning. Good to see you again, Andy. Hey, Randy. Hey, hey Randy. Alex, How are you, sir? Welcome to Oshkosh. Thank you, sir. It's just a great set of customers that we can we can work with on this yeah, aircraft. We're really looking forward to that. Yeah, that'd be cool. Very nice. Amazing. Well, here's the, uh, the final document for your airplane that you take in delivery of today. It just basically states that uh, you accept the airplane and it's finished, and uh, we can finalize the contract, the last piece of paper. Good stuff. Got to sign. We'll uh, we'll go flying. All right. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, thanks, guys. Yep. <clears throat> the Turbo DC3 combines the best of two worlds. From the past, the original license, the airframe, and the aviation features, and from the present, the safety of a modern cockpit. So I have. A little bit of time, four thousand or so, but uh, mostly in small stuff. So I just... When starting the engines, you can immediately hear the difference. The turbo prop sounds like a jet. No more buzzing of a piston engine. While in the past, 14 cylinders could easily overheat, the turbo DC-3 has fewer problems with hot or thin air. The newly outfitted plane can therefore fly at higher altitudes and is more powerful. This plane will soon be commissioned by NASA to carry out ice measurements at the South Pole. The German Alfred Wegener Institute has also bought two Turbo Classics and equipped them with sophisticated technology for polar research. Polar 6 will soon be setting off for the North Pole. Thomas, I'm releasing the coupling. Yo. Before leaving for the Arctic, the research equipment okay. is carefully tested. A laser is carried like a cruise missile under the hull. Okay, all is clear. Get off. Yo. This is our EM bird. Our EM bird is a great system. We fly at low level and the instrument records the thickness of the sea ice from 25 meters above its surface. Polar 6 flies slowly at 300 kilometers per hour and very low. This would be a serious disadvantage in passenger transportation, but it allows the researchers to gather accurate data over long distances. We've seen in recent years that the ice is getting thinner and thinner. In 2001, we found ice about 2.20 meters thick in summer. It was about half of that last year. And now we are curious to see what the ice looks like this year. The results of these research flights provide evidence of climate change, for example, in Greenland. Greenland loses three times as much ice every year as there is in the entire European Alps. The original features of the DC-3 include a sextant. This allows the pilot to navigate with the sun in case his GPS fails. Near the North Pole, the magnetic fields are a risk for modern navigation. Weather permitting, the team cruises over the North Atlantic for up to six hours a day. 
Within two weeks, 3,000 kilometers will be screened and a huge amount of data gathered. Station North is the northernmost point of Greenland, inhabited by only a few soldiers. The gravel runway at this Danish military post is not a problem for the DC-3. She manages well on uneven surfaces and can even land on snow and ice. The extraordinary versatility of the DC-3 is the reason for its long and exceptional career. You put it on wheels, as normally. You put it on skis. You can use it in wintertime off frozen rivers and lakes. You can use it in deserts. You can use it in small airports. You can use it in mountainous areas. It is a fantastic aircraft that can take off from fairly short fields using the technology that was available at the time. The Thousand Lives of the DC-3 was an exceptional journey through the 20th century. Luxurious Hollywood sleeper, D-Day cargo carrier, the savior of West Berlin, and now at the age of 80, helping to solve the riddles of climate change. No other aircraft has done more to shape the course of history. Keep at it, old girl.